things that are complementary to kind of help everyone in the field figure out what's yeah. going on. Yeah, but, sure. Well, that would be great. Thank you. Sure. Okay, so we have to switch to the discussion session. We are running out of time, above the time. So I'm, I hope that it's okay if we stay 15 minutes more um, above the program. So, uh, first of all, uh, since we are uh, discussing the materials, I think it will be very appropriate if uh, Benjamin Sesape will present a slide about another uh, promising material, which is indium oxide, for five minutes or something. So, Benjamin, can you go ahead if you're still here, yes. not sleeping? Not sleeping. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so can you show your slide about another promising material for um, kinetic conductor? And then we discuss uh, other questions regarding the previous talks. And I really hope that speakers can stay online and do not switch off before the end. Can you see my slide? Yes. Okay. OK, uh, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. So um, it's a few slides uh, that Lef asked me to present. Uh, it's about um, the disordered materials, which uh, is well known in the community of the superconductor insulator transition, but also metal insulator transition. So this is about uh, amorphous indium oxide. So it's a very well known material. If you put tin in it, you can uh, get this famous uh, ITO that you have in your cell phone for your full screen. And if you uh, prepare it in good condition, you can make it actually uh, amorphous and superconducting at low temperature. So um, I'm going to present you a few uh, data that were obtained by uh, Thibault Charpentier in collab close collaboration with Nicolas Rock in my institute, and also with Denis Basco uh, and Le Fiofri. So basically, this is more about um, material science to some extent. We are not uh, doing device uh, yet. And basically, we are characterizing this material. So why is this amorphous indium oxide? Because this is one of the most say, strongly disordered superconductors that we know, in the sense that uh, this material can reach a level of disorder such that all quasi all thermionic ex excitation that you would have without superconductivity, all electrons are actually localized. If you quantify disorder by uh, KFL, you see that KFL is much smaller than one. You have a low electron density, so which promises a quite low superfluid density. And uh, to some extent, this is a, studying this material uh, is a way to uh, investigate the extreme case of uh, disordered material. So if we understand what happens in that guy in terms of microwave properties, this may help to understand what happens in materials like titanium nitride or uh, niobium nitride or maybe granular aluminum. Um, so um, basically what we studied is very simple, is a, is a strip line that you see here, uh, which is coupled, uh, capacity coupled to a feed line and which allows us to uh, study the placement uh, uh, of uh, this resonator. And we have on chip systematically a roll bar because it's what we want to do is a systematic characterization of the uh, uh, material properties, so resistivity uh, as a function of the microwave uh, properties. And what you see here is that we can actually, on the right graph, we can uh, vary the level of disorder, which is quantified by the sheet resistance. And, and uh, as, as, a, as the disorder increase in this material that we can tune by the oxygen content, you see that the TC is decreasing. And this is a characteristic of a superconductor insulator transition. And this is what you want to do if you want to access very high uh, value of uh, kinetic inductance, which is uh, proportional to the sheet resistance. And you see also that the gap that has been uh, studied in, in great details by a scanning clearing spectroscopy remains relatively large uh, uh, in this material and actually does not vanish when you approach the transition to uh, insulation. And the other aspect which is important to pay attention to is the fact that we are reaching value of sheet resistance which are extremely high above the quantum of resistance uh, 6 uh, h over 4 e square and uh, the transition to insulation is very close to this value for uh, this particular geometry. 
So then what we do is we study uh, the, the placement dispersion uh, of this resonator here, simple resonator, uh, by standard two-tone uh, measurements. And, and then using the appropriate model uh, of, um, uh, for the placement dispersion for the capacitance on this geometry with the capacitance to the ground plate, then we can extract extremely precisely, and we have compared that with numerical simulation, the kinetic inductance as a function of disorder for this material. And this is the main uh, result of this short presentation, which is on the right plot, where you see the sheet inductance as a function of the sheet resistance. Uh, you see that at low disorder, we basically uh, obtain the Matisse-Bardin uh, formula for uh, the kinetic inductance. And once we approach this transition to insulation, where resistance becomes very high, uh, and many properties of the superconductor changes uh, spectroscopically and many other aspects, you see that there, are there is a clear deviation from BCS. And so far, we have measured as a maximum of uh, kinetic inductance of uh, 6 nano RV per square with this uh, uh, pretty high uh, precision uh, measurements method. And um, well, Lef asked me to make it short, so uh, I'm done. Thank you. If you have questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, and so now let's switch uh, to the questions to the talks. Um, if I can start myself, I would like to ask David Schuster if he's still around. David, are you? No? no? I'm here. I'm here. Ah, uh, thank you. Uh, so uh, you mentioned about you were talking about these two qubit gates, and it's possible that it's possible to do sigma x sigma x um, rotation with your te technique, right? And so uh, I, I didn't understand what is the time limit for these gates compared to the gap between the two states. Um, I think in, in principle, actually, the gap doesn't even set that time limit. Um, I think it's actually because it's really actually in some sense because it you know just like the single qubit well yeah because the single qubit x gate for example um, if we didn't put in that echo could be you know very fast it can be as fast as the uh, plasmon frequency because right? that's the anharmonicity yeah. um, and 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 this uh, the sigma x sigma x gate is like that so it, basically what you're doing is you're doing a uh, uh, you're you're doing a conditional flux displacement in some sense, or, or this, basically you're changing the sign based on the coupler and then, and, and, and then doing it. So, so in principle, it can be um, faster. I think in practice, we're going to want to have the same kind of echo. Um, so it'll probably be limited sort of also to around a Larmor um, procession period. Uh, and also, I think even though in principle, one, I think there's nothing that says there has to be a hierarchy between Sigma, the sigma x gates and the sigma x sigma x gates. I mean, in principle, one can make them the same order, but I, I think in practice, we may want to make the, it'll probably be easier to make it a little weaker. Um, uh, both the theory is a little easier, but but forgetting about that, I think also um, in terms of, you know, reducing um, crosstalk and things like that. So my, my guess is that it'll be a factor of, you know, three to 10 less. So do you say that you can have a, literally implement Hamiltonian in which this is by far the leading term? Uh, yeah, for sure. Well, yeah, uh, well... I yeah. wanted to make a comment, John Martinez, I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, what, what confuses me here is somehow because you have a low qubit frequency, it's, it's kind of instantaneous in sigma x and sigma x, but we know for other qubits would have higher frequencies, you get xx plus yy because of the rotating wave approximation. So I think it would be good for the theorists and the field to understand you know, how the rotating wave approximation goes from xx to xx plus yy. Is it abrupt? Is it continuous? What are the details there? Yeah, that's, John, it, that's exactly the reason why I asked this question, because yeah. uh, the, interac the interaction, which is only sigma plus, sigma minus, and that's what happens in rotating wave approximation, has many uh, problems if you think about surf, uh, error correction. Sigma xx, sigma x is much more uh, 
promising, if you wish. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I, I agree because uh, that's a, with the XX plus YY, you have to do multiple pulses. So I'm just trying to say we need to understand carefully how that transition happens. It would be great if you can do it. You just you have to make sure there's no other terms. Exactly. Yeah, and I think that it's really connected to exactly John's sort of question, which is that is this rotating wave approximation? And I think we can make. I think basically you can make the sigma xx term, you know, at least of order the the the, the, the Lamer frequency, if not larger. So you say that you can make it even larger than a sigma z term in this, uh, or sigma x term, or it's not really, or only comparable. Um, I think, I think in principle one can make it larger. I mean, I think, in, uh, at least for our first shot, we're not going to worry so much about. No, no because it for a long-term future, and you know, error correction, that's a crucial. Mm -hmm. um, so. It, it would be worth discussing it further, but I, I think it can be made larger. I mean, of course, there's another piece, which is that if uh, we are currently operating in a regime in which um, the Z, you know sigma z, which is the the tunnel splitting, is uh, is fixed, um, one can also make that tunable at the expense of another flux line, in which case you can just send it to zero. And and uh, but but the uh, um, and this doesn't affect the size of the xx term. So. This kind of says that you, you can do it, but uh, um, uh, and so so I, so the, I guess there's a couple of ways one can optimize it. If you have a fixed uh, sigma z, you could decide how big to make your sigma z, um, right? And then you could balance that against you know. So to do balance gates, things will be slower, but to do to have a pure xx type term, it, it could be easier. Um, or you could make it tunable so that you can have it you know the best of both worlds but then that will couple in noise at the sweet spot uh, i mean my my feeling was at least initially was that we would we would probably do like a balanced xx pulse to get some net two qubit um phase or, or, or well or gate or whatever and uh and then uh and then fix it up with single qubit terms um but as opposed to say you know having a an always on xx that's larger than the sigma z which could obviously be quite interesting Mm -hmm. um, Thank you. So there, I think there was another question that I just saw uh, by Andre uh, Klotz. Uh, Andre? Yes. Uh, so yeah, I have like question in a similar direction. So, but basically, yeah, let's say we solve this issue with the xx and the yy. But also, what about uh, just the like, practical possibility of uh, well some errors in the signal shape because for example similar gate uh, for zero pi qubits is protected against errors in the signal shape because the states are delocalized in the in phase but here they are very localized in phase um, so, so, so then what's the limitation due to signal shape yeah, we we like a, a a sort of a, a design principle for our gates is that we always try to make sure there's an embedded echo in them, and so both both that there should be an echo for flux noise, and also that um, there should be net zero flux, so that we don't get you know um, there's this technical thing which if you put flux pulses on your on lines there tends to be like both a sort of a nanosecond, microsecond kind of scale filter function, and also like a millisecond scale filter function, which is really painful. And so, but if you if you uh, make it so that sort of the minimum bandwidth is a megahertz, and and the max and the echo is sort of on the scale of the uh, Larmor period, um, then you can cut it off. You can cut off the one or f. Well, you can cut off any noise from both below and above. So we so we do that. So you're not you know fully protected in the sense that like. You're still sensitive to one over f noise, um, but you, you can really define the bandwidth over what over your sensitivity, and that's going to be something like, you know, the Larmor. It's going to range from something around the Larmor period um, to a little bit uh, larger. Um, okay, so so you're basically quadratically protected against low frequency noise, and uh, yeah. 
and and also then you're like limited by like reasonably high frequency noise which is left. Yeah, that's which is not, not, too, not too quick and doesn't average itself. Out. Yeah. Okay. okay. So the next question it seems to be uh, uh, Michael um, for Vlad. Is it correct? Or M Michelle for uh, there is a mistype. Who? Yeah, I think it's Michael. I think it's for Vlad. He asked, "What is sensitivity?" I think it's about the Bloxonian. It's about sensitivity to this curvature of the radius because it peeled up, and whether or not that can be controlled. Um, yes, yeah, sorry. What's the question again? Um, which curvature? When you talk about your Bloxonian, the the inductor inductor loop start to that curve is oh, curving. Yeah. Um, yeah, you can. Uh, so you see, I showed you a picture in my uh, title slide where we could curl it a couple times. Um, but actually, that's not um, desired because then you're again creating a messy structure. So it's actually best when it just kind of, uh, you know, does something like that because then your junction is maximally far away from any other electromagnetic structure. And um, yeah, the way it's controlled is, um, it's a bit artisanic because essentially what you do is you etch and then you watch, and then you just control your um, etch a little bit. So, um, so well, this, this Vlad, is, can you share, do you want to share the screen? Because it's very difficult to understand what you mean. Um, sure, well, it's probably not very important. But yeah, let me try. Um, oh, let's see, how do I do this? Yeah, I, I was just wondering because I noticed that when you showed the picture of 10 different devices, um, they were, th th some of them had different radius of curvature than the others. And I was wondering if um, the actual behavior of the device was sensitive to that, uh, that, that sort of variable. No, no, it, well, okay. I mean, we haven't really measured that many de devices to <laughs> tell you that uh, accurately, but uh, from my, I mean, the reason I show you that picture was that was to actually uh, argue that it's more or less the same. You see, see. Uh, you you have higher standards, so, so you see. To me, all this all this um, releases looks more. I mean, it's true that some some of it popped up like higher up and some of it less. But yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but uh, I yeah I wouldn't be able to tell. We measured only a few devices, and they seem to I be see. all working more or less the same way. Okay. Um, yeah, I was just curious. Thank you. Yeah, yeah sure. So the next question is um, Ilya for David. Yeah. Yes, uh, so I was interested. Uh, so you have a flux line coupled to your fluxonium qubit, and flux lines are a bit annoying because, uh, um, yeah, you, you have a decay rate. So you need a large amplitude of a signal. You can't put attenuators into the cryostat, at least not on the, uh, on the mixing chamber plate. And uh, th that's the reason why people put these bias T's, but bias T's are bad too, because you have these millisecond things, uh, but then you can couple stronger, but if you couple stronger, then you have a large, uh, a small lifetime. So it's always a trade-off between other stuff. And what I was interested in is, what was your coupling uh, of the flux line to your fluxonium qubit? What was the lifetime of the zero one transition uh, relative to this decay into the flux line and the, uh, the decay rate of the 1 2 transition relative to um, yeah, decay into the flux line? Sure, great question. Um, so I think our uh, the sort of inductance ratio was something like a milliamp per flux quantum or something around that, that scale. Um, and um, we don't currently have any filtering on it. Um, the thing that helps us with that is that you can think of an, you know, an inductive coupler as being like a two-pole low pass, right? Because there's a, there's a small capacitance uh, in series and then, there's a, and then the inductor is a small inductor to ground. And so the scaling is like omega to the fourth. And remember our thing is at 14 megahertz. So, uh, so we're not really limited by that in our main transition. Uh, in the, um, for the plasmon, I, we're also relatively low frequency. We're at three gigahertz and, and 
Um, in principle, that could be a limitation, but in practice, I, I think we're just, we were limited uh, of Purcell through the readout resonator in our case, we did a pretty low Q readout resonator. Um, so, so it's definitely something to keep in mind. And I do, um, you know, I, I imagine we might um, uh, embed some filtering. We could just put a low pass filter um, right into that line um, uh, to, to improve things further. Um, but even, but right now it's not limiting us, but, but it's, it's something we are aware of. So we, we did all the calculations for that and we did, we did find that it wasn't um, limiting us and we uh, uh, currently, um, and we believe we still have some headroom. Uh, so we don't think we have to do it right away, but uh, it is something we're looking at. And we'd also like to optimize on that. Uh, that's definitely a point of optimization, like um, just for sort of heating and crosstalk and things like that. So I think that's a place where um, there's a lot of work to be done, but but I don't think in terms of the decay, it's it's a limiting factor right now. We, we have some ways to go. Thank you. And uh, then uh, who is uh, Daniel for you, Daniel. Daniel, you are muted, Daniel. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, it just took me a minute to unmute. Uh -huh. um, Johan. Hi. In the plot where you showed um, that you could measure quantum jumps and there was this idea that the system was not doing anything strange with the large photon number, you know, not jumping into higher levels or anything like that. Yeah. Um, what was the vertical axis of that plot? The, the y-axis. There's, there's a trace jumping around. Yeah, that's that the, it's the quadrature of the, um, uh, of the IQ response plane. Okay, so I just wanted to caution you that what can happen sometimes is that when you jump to those higher states, what happens in the IQ plane is not necessarily obvious, and you might not even see it in a plot like that. So ah, I would... well, well, but the, the thing is that uh, that was just a cut, but we do measure the entire IQ plane. So ah, Okay, so you looked at it in 2D? Yeah, so this is the entire plane, right? Can you see the... Yes, can, and actually... Can you see my... I was gonna ask, what, what's going on on the rightmost panel? It looks like the top cloud is a little bit smeared out. Do you know what that is? Yeah, exactly. So that's the point. Oh, can I move this? It's a bit funny. I'm trying to uh, make it full screen. Um, uh, so, oh, finally. <laughs> um, yeah, so this, the, you mean these little points here? Yeah. Yeah, so that's 1% at most usually. Uh, and it, it's, uh, it depends on, on the power of the readout, and that's actually the F state. So we can clearly see it's the F state right here. So here we drive, we add a parametric amplifier, and then you see everything blows up, everything becomes even more clear. But you, you can see from the color scale here, which is, you see, spans over many orders of magnitude, you can see this is like some less than 100 counts, so we're like 100 counts, and this is like 10,000 counts. Yep. So this is like a 1% effect, uh, which corresponds to the F state. That's, per actually see that's the particularly interesting to me, because in that 2016 paper that you mentioned, we actually saw about a 1% jump to the F state, but you can't see it in the paper because we didn't plot it on a log scale. Ah, uh, okay. We actually did see this and never really understood where it was coming from. I see, I see, yeah. So we are, we are trying to understand this, um, and we think it's related, in the end, we think it's, it's related to the original um, um, hypothesis in, in, in the CQED paper, like the critical photon number. So we think that the reason why we leak to the F state is actually because if you have some population in the E state, uh, the E to F transition is not that far from the readout resonator, that's why you have chi, as Vlad explained, and uh, the critical photon number for that transition is not that high. Um, <clears throat> sorry, that's like a few hundred photons. The critical photon number for the G to E transition is like 10,000. So that's also, I think, that, that's a speculation, but if, if we can confirm that, it also tells us, tells us what to do to make this even better, basically to avoid leakage to the F state altogether. Okay, thanks, Johan. Uh, I have a quick question. What were the yeah. frequency transitions between the e, uh, G and E and E and F? 
Okay, so this is a point where having a student in the audience would be great <laughs> because I could relay the question to the student. But I, I remember that it's um, it's something in the range. So G2E was something like 800 uh, megahertz. Uh, and then E to F was something like seven gigahertz. And then the cavity was at 7.5 or something like that. So okay. The, the tuning between E to F is less than a gigahertz. From the yeah, that's good enough. Okay, so next question I think is Pavel for Oleg. Yes. Oleg? Yes. Hi. So my question is, uh, in your presentation you mentioned two types of films. It's a highly disordered and, and uh, high quality aluminum oxide film. Question number one is, how do you define or what is your definition of highly disordered and especially highly uh, high quality film? Okay, highly disordered or strongly disordered. Okay, there are some specialists who will answer this question much better than me. But actually, that's, uh, I think, the um, uh, physically, the scattering lens for electrons or quasi-particles is shorter than coherence lens. Okay. Uh, and uh, okay, but for me, for me, uh, what's important is that to have a high uh, resistance per square. To uh, if we approach to quantum resistance, then the tunneling of vortices is possible through a nanowire. As for quality of uh, aluminum, uh, aluminum oxide, I meant actually the following: that uh, loss should be much less than we observe now in titanium nitride or heavy nitride films. Uh, also, maybe electrical properties should be more homogeneous. Okay, basically, qubits made out of that should uh, demonstrate much better quality. That's the main point. Yeah, so uh, that's why my second question was how, how did you measure, especially high quality film? So I understood you electrically measured, uh, you only electrically measured uh, the properties. Yeah, we just implemented the qubits, built qubits, and see what's the coherence time. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Uh, the next question is you for David. Yeah, yeah. Hey, David, I have a question for your couple of design. Um, I do believe what you said is true. I think the leading term will be XX, especially your cubic frequency is low. However, I think the problem, at least when we design the genome, is the control cost. If you imagine instead of, instead of just two qubits with a coupler, you imagine you have three qubits with three couplers. I think the control problem become a very nonlinear set of equation which you need to solve three transcendental equations and that become extremely hard. However, in order to achieve high enough coupling strength of Hamiltonian, I don't see a different way other than galvanic coupling. I don't know what your thought on this. Yeah, I, I would love to be using a geometric coupling, but I, I agree. I, it, I, at least we couldn't think of one initially, so we're, we're doing it. Um, Galvanically, and and of course for two qubits it doesn't matter at all, um, yeah. so that's fine for now. Um, so we figured we would just do that. Um, uh, for yeah, for more qubits, um, it does tile nicely, and our hope is that you know, if we if we let's say operate on only non-adjacent pairs, um, you know that there could be some coupling, but it you know it should be suppressed by intervening couplers. So so we figure that um, we should be able to sort of trade parallelism against crosstalk. Um, smoothly such that we don't have to fully solve that problem. So I think, you know, the, to first order, we'll try to minimize any geom geometric type crosstalk. And I know you, uh, I've been super impressed um, by the uh, the low crosstalk on the flux lines for your tunable transmons and, and all of the Google work. That's a, a huge uh, technical achievement. Um, so I, I, I'm hoping we can we can do something similar or, or that if, if you guys adopt it, you can leverage that. Um, the uh, um, and then uh, for the, but there's probably some crosstalk even in the Hamiltonian itself um, that will require it. And but I hope that we can basically isolate it to small clusters and then um, and try to to lower it with that. So you know you could imagine having multiple couplers, for example, in series or something like that if you needed to. But but it, I, I think that it, it will be sufficiently small that we can probably get away with it um, with, with just you know uh, by just making sure that we are only manipulating sort of every other pair of things at a time. But we'll have to see that that's a that's a real concern for long term scalability. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. 
Okay, uh, if I think that if there are no more questions, we can wrap up for today because we are already over time. Uh, so can I have one more question, uh, Lev? Oh, yes, of course. It's for Young, um, Pop. Um, yes. My question is, when you have your granular aluminum, you model the tunnel, model the tunnel junctions, but there's also dielectric loss in the aluminum oxide. And since it's a large volume, on average, it's going to be a few times 10 to minus 3. Now, you're mostly shorting out that loss from all the inductors. But has that been included in the model to give no. you idea? No, no, we did not include that in the model. That's why I was saying that our model is, is very crude, as someone pointed out during the talk, actually. Um, and um, it also only makes sense for low, uh, in the limit of low frequencies or in the limit of very high frequencies. So I think it's quite, it gives a quite good idea of the plasma frequency uh, when basically each grain charges with opposite sign in a way. Um, but, and it gives a good idea of what's happening in the linear part right at the beginning. But my guess is you're in the low frequency limit because the, um, the, these grains are small and, and, and um, the capacitance is going to be small, uh, you know, so that you're, you're doing that. So I think in that limit, you should be able to build a simple model based on what you've already done to estimate roughly what that dissipation should be. And there should be like I think a frequency yes. uh yes. I think it's not frequency dependent because you're in a you, you know kind of dispersive low frequency limit. I see. You're saying we should calculate the participation ratio of that dielectric right. and and yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. We should we should I've do that. Done this before and it would be interesting to to put that in your calculations. And my guess it's not gonna be large, but one should do the calculation. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. And okay. if, if I if I may add, um, so the the fact that we take this A parameter in the model, which is the grain size, we take it to be the TM size of the grains, in a way it, it's a it's an arbitrary choice to some degree. It's the least no, no, let me say it like this. It's the least arbitrary choice. <laughs> it's the least yeah. arbitrary choice. But it, it doesn't have to be that. You should, should be able to calculation to see if it's possible that it's a problem. You yeah, know, yeah so. exactly. Yeah, yeah. We, and we can account for some different grain sizes. Because right, right. as, as someone was mentioning during the talk, it could be that the actual effective grain, let's say, is several grains coalescing and yeah. making like a bigger structure. Yeah. But thank you. Yeah, thank you. OK, let's adjourn till tomorrow now, or there is a one, some other questions. Okay, thank you. Let's thank the speakers and so hope to see you tomorrow. Thanks, everyone. So great. Yeah. See you tomorrow. See you, see you tomorrow. tomorrow.